Hey there, QM Connect land. What a day. You know, we started the morning off with a, a group run and just kept going from there. The keynote, holy cow, that was so fantastic. We had a bunch of great sessions. We had wonderful posters and, you know, it was just one heck of a day. I, Twitter was just lightning fast with so many great positive tweets, people connecting to new ideas, sharing ideas, and then elaborating on them even further in the back channel. So, you know, it just was a fantastic day and I hope everyone had as much fun as I did and, and really enjoyed themselves. And think, we have yet another day to go of this, so I am, cannot wait to see what Tuesday is gonna be like. Okay, so one thing I gotta tell you is this is so humbling for me. Appreciate the opportunity to come here. I am a first generation college student with imposter syndrome and I don't think I'll ever get over that. Um, just kind of moving my way through. Those of you who don't know what imposter syndrome is, you wake up each morning and you think, well, I'm not as good as people think I am, but I'll just fake it today and see how it goes. <laughs> Eventually they'll catch on, but until they do, I'm gonna have fun. Um, the thing to keep in mind, of course, is it's rampant in education. Faculty members have it, administrators have it, and students have it. So we're always kind of working against that. Luckily, I have a phenomenal wife, and she's always been right there with me. I've been married now for 34 years, and yeah, that's woo tough. I mean, every morning I wake up and think, ooh, are you lucky? Now, <laughs> starts our day right. Um, <laughs> She was right there for me when I got the job at UNC Chapel Hill. I mean, I didn't, I wouldn't have hired me. That's the imposter syndrome part. I wouldn't have hired me. And yet they, they called me and said, we'd like to offer you this job to, to be the faculty development director at UNC Chapel Hill, 3,000 faculty members. I'm thinking, wow. And I told her, I said, Deborah, they just offered me this job. And, and she said, only in America could you get a job teaching teachers how to teach at a school you could never have gotten into. <laughs> Then I'm the Department of Family Medicine. I mean, I'd like to tell students, you don't know where you're gonna end up. So you work hard, you do what you can, and, and you get there. The idea of connections and pathways, we do that. And we do it for other people. So I wanna, I wanna hit this idea of connecting and also for building pathways. You see, if we're not careful, the wrong pathways can be built. Because as you move over and over down a course of action, you groove a path. Sometimes it's good, which we're gonna hit several of those. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes we accidentally, you know, if, if you think about this, if you're wandering through the woods and you happen to make a turn where you think looks good and you're gonna leave the path and go in another direction and you knock over a few fines and maybe step on a few things, the next person coming along may see that somebody went there and then they'll go there. And if you have ever in your life been out hiking and took a little spur that went like eight steps around a big tree and then ended because there was just like nothing there and then came back, those were individuals who took that path over and over and over again and grooved it in. And if we groove that in, then we're grooving in something that's bad. So pathways aren't for good or bad. Pathways are just pathways. Hopefully they go to good things. By the way, here's one quick one for you. A rampage I've been on just recently. I am looking for some data that says that lecturing is bad, that you cannot learn from lecturing. This is a bright group of people here. If somebody in here could find me a single study that says that lecturing is bad, I would love to read it. And no, you may not pull out Wyman stuff from the Wyman Project on lecturing being not as good as active learning, which is another little issue I've got. Um, you can't pull anything from Eric Mazur's work. You can't pull anything from Scott Freeman's article, a meta-analysis of 250 articles. All those things show that when you put active learning with lecturing, it gets better. But that doesn't mean that lecturing is bad. And yet the number of people who will shut down and say, oh, that's a lecture, you can't learn from lectures. Oh, that person's lecture, you can't learn from lectures. Students today can't learn from lectures. That's the, that's the little path that goes around the tree. You can't learn once you become disengaged. You become disengaged from bad lectures. We shouldn't do bad lectures. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do all lectures. So the point is, be careful of the paths we create. How do I demonstrate value? What can we do for repetition? What can we do to pull things in? If you can do that, you will groove in those pathways of learning for your students. And be very mindful of those types of things where you do have the short path that kind of winds behind a tree and is the dead end. Because if somebody keeps doing something over and over again and it's wrong, it won't stop people from doing it. In fact, the more often something is done that's wrong and goes off into a direction like that, the more often people will do things like that. 
I'm going to end with one of the most provocative ones. That phrase out there that active learning is more effective than lecturing is a path around a tree. When somebody says active learning is more effective than lecturing, I have to say, I wrote a book on 101 different lecture uh, active learning techniques. 101 different lecture uh, active learning techniques. I believe in active learning. I got another book out, Dynamic Lecturing. Dynamic Lecturing is all about the value of lectures. I believe in both pedagogical approaches. There's at least 12 different types of lectures. There's uh, hundreds of different ways of doing active learning. A statement that active learning is better than lecturing, what kind of active learning, what kind of lecturing, what kind of student, what kind of environment, what kind, what kind, what kind, what kind. Let's stop talking about those things and talk about students learning. Students learn best when. And if someone says, well, you know, they don't learn from lecture, don't go with a stereotype and use that as a prototype. A lecture is not necessarily the person who stands back here, and I could have done that. Hey, everybody, thank you for coming. It's so good to see you. What I want to do today is talk to you about a five-point plan for learning, and as we go through this five-point plan, you will notice that you will be going to sleep. In fact, you're already going to sleep. <laughs> that took approximately 22 seconds. Yes, lecturing can be very non-engaging and can put you to sleep and not be effective. <coughs> lecturing can also be a situation that draws you in and gives you tremendous information in a short period of time. Storytelling has done that for years. The point is, don't go down the path around the tree without figuring out what's happening. Appreciate your attention. I think we have a few minutes for questions, but first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for coming, letting me stand on the stage. I'm not smart enough or good enough to be here, but until someone pulls me off, I'm going to keep doing it. So thank you. I tried to describe what we have going on with QM Research. Uh, the rubric and the whole peer review process um, are supported by research, so we want for people to know that. We want for people to know that we update this research um, when it comes time to revising the rubric, and that's what the feedback loop that we're talking about.